MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. We got the first days of spring and we've got astronauts back from space. Today we're going to talk about the vernal equinox, what the sun has to do with disease, and what that has to do with NASA astronauts coming back from space and mitochondrial dysfunction. I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt, the co-founder of MedCram.com, where we have multiple videos on our website that are not just for continuing medical education, but also if you want to know more about what's going on in your own body and how to relate to this in terms of tests. We've got a great course called Your Analysis Explained Clearly, and it's also for three CME credits. Join us at MedCram.com. Astronauts back from space, and big story here in terms of the issues with aging in space. As it turns out, yes, there are some real issues with microgravity in space and actually what is going on. NASA actually put together a really nice article, which we'll put a link to, that describes a lot of the problems that are going on in microgravity in space it has to do with mitochondrial changes, something that may sound familiar to a lot of you that have watched MedCram.com. In fact, there was a paper that was published in Cell, which we'll put a link to in the description below, where they say, quote, we found a universal mechanism that explains the kinds of changes we see to the body in space and in a place we didn't expect. Everything gets thrown out of whack, and it all starts with the mitochondria. Comprehensive multi-omics analysis reveals mitochondrial stress as a central biological hub for space flight impact. So basically, they studied 59 astronauts, looked at blood, urine, multi-omics, basically, and they found that at the center of a lot of this is DNA damage, mitochondrial processes, and the innate immune system. You can see that some of this stuff gets very complex in terms of upregulation, downregulation, etc. We really don't have time to geek out on this, but yes, you're looking at things correctly. This is the TCA cycle, and it gets down to that granularity. Something that caught my eye was in early 2020, the first occurrence of a venous thrombosis was reported during spaceflight. They also concluded that spaceflight-induced mitochondrial dysfunction could increase cardiovascular disease risk, long-term missions caused by microgravity, cardiovascular deconditioning, and space radiation. They also talked about reactive oxygen species activity, a lot of what we've talked about on this channel. They also talked about inane immunity and interferons. And there was a whole section on vitamin D as well. They find that vitamin D is lower in astronauts after they've come back. So they really do make the case that astronauts are suffering from mitochondrial dysfunction. And I think it's very telling that this all affects a lot of the things that we've been talking about for the last four or five years. And they also make the point, and I hope those that are interested in going to Mars are listening, that these sort of things need to be tackled if we're going to have space flight to Mars. And if we're going to tackle these everyday mundane health things, we're going to need funding to figure that out. Otherwise, we're not going to have millions and millions of people on Mars in the next 50 years. Unfortunately, to be able to figure that out, we're going to need funding. So what does all of this have to do with the first days of spring? The vernal equinox is when the sun is now at the equator and it's coming into the northern hemisphere, which means now in the northern hemisphere, days are going to be getting longer than the nights, but the opposite is true in the southern hemisphere. And I bring that up because of this graph. This graph is really an important graph to understand. And it's because of the issue that we've talked about many times, and that is that sunlight gives off ultraviolet light, it gives visible light and it gives infrared or near-infrared light. Near-infrared light is able to penetrate through clothes and skin and tissue where it gets down to the mitochondria. And when it gets down into the mitochondria, it actually efficiently elevates metabolism. Now that's important to understand because the aging theory of mitochondrial dysfunction states that as you get older, the amount of ATP that you are producing drops by 70%. That's huge. And so if you want to reverse aging or at least slow it down, one of the major ways of doing that is to increase metabolism in the presence of near-infrared radiation. That near-infrared radiation is going to vary with the seasons. I'm going to draw some lines here. These lines are January 1st. Notice where the peak is. It's about one to three weeks after the shortest day of the year, which is December 21st. 
Here is January 1st, and you can see it right there. So that's heart disease. What about cancer? Notice that cancer has a peak exactly at the same time. We're talking about heart disease and cancer. These are not infectious diseases. What about chronic lower respiratory diseases right here? Notice that it peaks exactly at the same time, one to three weeks after the shortest day of the year. What about Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, kidney disease, and influenza and pneumonia? Notice that all of these are peaking at approximately the same time, one to three weeks after the shortest day of the year. Both infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases are all peaking at exactly one to three weeks after the shortest day of the year. And when are they the lowest? About one to three weeks after the longest day of the year. Let's clear all of this because I want to show you something else. Some people will say it's because when it's cold, people go inside. And when people go inside, that's when they're more likely to get viral infections. That would be a great explanation if the only thing that we saw peaking during the winter were infectious diseases. That's not the case. Heart disease is not an infectious disease. Alzheimer's disease is not an infectious disease. Diabetes is not an infectious disease. Kidney disease is not an infectious disease. And yet, they also peak at exactly the same time. Also, if this were because of cold weather and people are going inside and that's what's causing it, we would not see a very smooth undulating period because people don't go inside with increasing or decreasing temperature. It usually hits a threshold and then people go inside. And so what we would expect to see is we'd expect it to be flat and then all of a sudden peak when that temperature had reached a specific minimum causing people to go inside. So it doesn't make sense. That theory of temperature driving this does not make sense. Further to that point is when we look at Australia. Australia, obviously, is in the Southern Hemisphere, and that's why we would expect to see these same peaks for influenza to be six months out of phase. In other words, it's going to peak again just shortly after the shortest day of the year, but the shortest day of the year in Australia is June 21, and that's why we see these peaks for influenza in the middle of June and July, August. This is down in Australia. And if you look at the coldest day in Sydney, you will see that the high in June, July in Sydney is literally in the mid 60s. That's not exactly weather where people all of a sudden go inside because it's too cold. So that doesn't make any sense. Also, notice the difference in heart disease. Look at these differences from the bottom to the top. These are a pretty big delta. I'll call this the delta for cardiac disease. This is zero right here, the delta for influenza. Influenza and pneumonia are combined. So here we're looking at influenza and pneumonia. There is a delta there, but that delta is smaller. This is the delta for influenza and pneumonia. Clearly, the delta for cardiac disease is bigger than the delta for influenza and pneumonia. There are more people with a change in cardiac deaths during the flu season than there are an increased change in flu deaths during the flu season. Let me say that again. During the flu season, which is this period of time here where all of these deaths are basically going up, there are actually more deaths due to cardiac disease. There's more increase in deaths due to cardiac disease than there is an increase in deaths due to influenza and pneumonia. So this is a graph looking at deaths from influenza in Singapore. Singapore is about 80 miles from the equator. There is no seasonal variation. There's certainly peaks and troughs, but there is no seasonal variation here, and it makes perfect sense as to why. It's because the sun is always at a specific height in the sky when you're at the equator. You're not going to be getting these extremes because of the planetary tilt, where you're going to have the seasons where the sun is very high in the sky and staying up and have long days and then have these short days. These short and long days is what's causing the variation in infrared light, which is causing the variation in mitochondrial dysfunction, which is causing the increase in deaths. Because when mitochondria don't work, nothing works. As we've seen multiple problems with space travel and mitochondrial dysfunction, we're seeing exactly the same thing here. Except we're not dealing with a microgravity environment, we're dealing with a lack of sunlight during the winter season, whether it's in the northern hemisphere or in the southern hemisphere.
Probably the best evidence, though, for this is a paper that was published from the Harvard Kennedy School, which is actually the political school at Harvard University, where in 2009, there was the H1N1 pandemic. Instead of peaking in the wintertime, like most flus do, it actually peaked in the summertime. And so for the first time, they were able to decouple the fact that the flu always comes during the season where it is cold, but also the days are the shortest. Here, we had a situation where the flu came in July, where it was warm, but later on, there was decreased sunlight because of the fact that the summer of 2009 was actually dimmer and darker and had more cloud cover. So they were able to decouple temperature from sunlight. What was it that actually drove the equation? What was it that actually predicted the influenza index? Well, when they looked at CDC data for influenza and they looked at solar radiation data, they were able to calculate out an association. What they found was that it was sunlight that actually strongly protected against getting influenza. This paper that was published in 2021, autumn COVID-19 surge dates in Europe correlated to latitudes, not to temperature or humidity, pointing to vitamin D as a contributing factor. They didn't realize that it may not have been vitamin D, but it was certainly sunlight. What did they find in this paper? What they did was they found the date in the specific country in Europe when COVID-19 took off. So in the autumn, you know that the sun is going down towards the southern hemisphere. The first countries that are going to fall in that shadow of critical time where you're going to actually have longer nights than days are going to be those countries in the northern latitudes, so countries like Finland. And the last country is going to be countries in the south of Europe, which is going to be countries like Greece. When they looked at that inflation date to see when that surge was in those countries, and they plotted it out with temperature in that country. There was absolutely no correlation with temperature. The R squared was 0.00. So temperature had absolutely no prediction as to when these viruses start to spike. What about humidity? Again, the R squared, 0.00. There was absolutely no correlation whatsoever with either temperature or humidity. However, when they looked at country latitude and they plotted from Finland all the way to Greece, you can see here very clearly that there was a very strong correlation, the R squared being 0.77. It's not temperature. It's sunlight. It's latitude. There was also another paper. This one came out of the UK, specifically out of the University of Edinburgh, and they looked at areas specifically where there could not have been any vitamin D made because the sun was too low in the sky. They cut out specific areas of the United States where they did not measure because vitamin D could be made there. They only looked at the areas where no vitamin D could be made. And what did they find? That the more ultraviolet A radiation there was, the more sunlight there was, the lower the mortality from COVID-19. Same thing with England. The higher the UVA, the lower the mortality. The higher the UVA in Italy, the lower the mortality. In fact, it was so profound that the authors of the study wrote this, quote, it suggests that optimizing sun exposure may be a possible public health intervention. Given that the effect appears independent of a vitamin D pathway, it suggests possible new COVID-19 therapies. I've had multiple patients now that are acutely ill that I've taken out into the sunlight, and they've improved dramatically. I've not done any studies. I've had people call me about loved ones that have been in the hospital, specifically that have been taken out into the sunlight and improved in dramatic fashion after being in the hospital for weeks and languishing and even ready to die and made improvements. There was this paper in Brazil, 30 subjects hospitalized from COVID-19, getting just seven days, only 15 minutes of very minimal infrared light at 940 nanometers, literally being discharged from the hospital four days faster than the controls. As we move into spring and the days start getting longer and longer, we're going to be having a great benefit in the Northern Hemisphere. But I am a little bit worried about my friends in the Southern Hemisphere, because now that the days are getting shorter, you're going to be getting less available sunlight. You're going to have to fight, and you're going to have to make sure that you get outside for that sunlight, because as it gets more and more scarce, your body is going to need it more and more, and you're going to have to fight for it more and more. 
And this is not only in the acute setting, but also for longevity. There's been multiple studies that have shown that people who spend more time in the sun is associated with more time on Earth. In other words, longevity is tied to sun exposure. And it's interesting because it's all tied to mitochondrial dysfunction, and we know that mitochondrial dysfunction is tied to short living periods. The enemy of longevity is chronic disease. And if you ever see chronic disease, I want you to look at it in its eyes and say, let's take this fight outside. To my friends in the Southern Hemisphere, over the next six months, please don't be another statistic. Get outside and enjoy that sunlight. Do it responsibly. Make sure you're getting about 15 to 30 minutes every day. You can cover up if you want. You can put a broad rimmed hat on. You can wear long sleeves. Just make sure that you're getting light outside.